Uh, as you can see here, I'm actually uh, chairman of uh, IEEE Computer Society in UK and uh, RI, United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, for me to give a presentation here. Uh, I mean the organizer of this conference, a chairman of this IEEE Computer Society in UK RI. I was deeply uh, impressed by the publicity and organization of this conference. I would name this conference as one of the best organized activity uh, we have sponsored over the past few years. And uh, thank you for the organizer. Thank you for, uh, yeah. So the title of my presentation, uh, Towards 2020 Computing, we we'll do something and uh, prediction about the future. That's my talk. So I was introduced by my friend, and I'm from a university uh, called the University of Kent. I'm actually head of school of computing. This school used to be called Computing Lab, and it was formally opened by the Queen, Her Majesty, uh, a few years ago. That's our school. I would like to say, uh, welcome to England, welcome to London, and uh, my university is not far from here. I'm half the host, I think. So some exciting places, and uh, I would like to recommend to you. And uh, this is a, a place not far from here, a uh, science museum near Hyde Park. Uh, 200 years ago, this gentleman, Charles Babbage, invented the first mechanical computer in the world. If you go to Science Museum today, you can still see the replica of this first mechanical computer 200 years ago built. Uh, even his brain, oh, his brain is here. So well preserved in a jar. So Charles Babbage, Science Museum, not far from Hyde Park in London. Another place, uh, it may be too far, uh, Blanchley Park, yesterday the keynote speaker and, uh, and uh, Kevin mentioned this, because last year it was the London Olympic year. It was also and, uh, important to all IT professionals, because and, uh, this place is linked with a great name, uh, Alan Turing, father of computer science. In 1940s, uh, he led a team there in developing a computer. You know, it's World War II, and uh, at that time, German changed it in suffering key on a daily basis. Although he is a, a famous uh, mathematician a professor at the University of Cambridge, he still needs this computer to help him uh, speed up code breaking. So that's father of computer science, Alan Turing. So Blanchley Park. Do you know where it is? If you draw triangle linking Cambridge, Oxford, and London, so this one in the middle, not far, one hour or something, uh, to the north, yeah, Blanchley Park. So last year it was his century because he was born 101 years ago. Alan Turing. So the title of my presentation is uh, uh, Towards 2020 Computing. Actually, I borrowed this title from this famous report produced a few years ago by a group of leading scientists. They're from leading university and the leading uh, companies, namely 30 authors spanning 12 nationality, including some big names like uh, Professor Amort from Microsoft, uh, Professor um, uh, Stephen from uh, University of California and uh, my friend Andy Parker from Cambridge University Cavendish Laboratory. So they work out such a report. I bought the title. In this report, uh, they mentioned 
and the computer science is going beyond computer science, which means computer science or computer knowledge skills is becoming a literacy like mathematics to physics. Without computer science, um, it's difficult for one to engage with other subjects. So it's a literacy. Uh, the UK eScience program, have you heard of this? And it's a good example of this. Have you heard of UK eScience program? The government put 300 million pounds and uh, even in its first three years. So eScience like e-business, e-commerce, e-government. So we use internet to do scientific research. That is e-science. That's computer science. The other observation include, and the computing is a career for 21st century. So how to prepare next generation and uh, IT professionals, engineers, who are not only mathematically uh, uh, literate, but also computationally literate is our task. Actually, my school and uh, a training and uh, 30 uh, computer science teachers, uh, every summer we run summer schools and uh, the UK government launched a, a CAS initiative a few years ago, computing at the schools. So not only at the university level and even the primary schools, uh, secondary school, uh, kids are taught advanced computer science. Uh, not only you know word processing, Excel games, but also and the program behind the animation, behind the games they are playing. So computer science, the future is bright. Uh, the report has also prepared at least uh, a roadmap consisting of uh, some milestones. As you can see here, some relating to cloud computing. I'm going to uh, talk something about it. Uh, green computing, energy efficient computing, and brain computing, and bio inspired computing. So, what is the computing towards 2020? So, it features with service, intelligence, connectivity, mobility, interactivity. Nowadays, people are forming different knowledge communities and they're working together to solve the problems that were solved uh, traditionally and by individuals, but it's not the case anymore. People need to work as a team to do that. That is why they need a service first to encapsulate the resources. They need intelligence, obviously, to be smart. They need connectivity to share information they need the mobility to work at any time, anywhere. They need interactivity. They need a user-friendly uh, interface to do the job, easy to use. That's uh, computing towards 2020. Uh, if you don't have questions, I'm going to move to introduction of uh, my own research or my team's research. So, so far is uh, background, context, introduction. So next, I'm going to cover four pieces of our research activities. Cloud computing, uh, green computing, brain computing, and future computing. First, cloud computing. So yesterday, uh, Dr. Tony uh, already introduced something about big data in practice. So what is cloud computing? Very simple. So internet-based something, and the internet is a communication channel for, for cloud computing. Few years ago, and uh, a leading research group in University of California, as you can see here, they published a paper um, it's called Berkeley's View about cloud computing. In this paper, you can see a table of uh, 10 obstacles for cloud computing or 10 opportunities. So more or less, we are uh, tackling the problem number four, data transfer bottlenecks. So I don't know I should go deeply uh, to involve you with 
many technical detail, but simply speaking, this is a, you know, communication, data communication protocol stack. So we focus our interest on this layer, it's called a socket, is a below application layer above TCP IP UDP socket, yeah. Uh, concretely, socket could be further divided into two sub-layers. One is called the BSD socket. It is, uh, you know, is entry point to the user space. Another one is INET socket, is entry point to the kernel. So you can imagine all system call will be handled there. So this socket layer, uh, we introduce the third layer called a socket multiplier here. Instead of opening one TCP IP stream, and uh, we open multiple INET socket, accordingly, multiple TCP or UDP streams. Ho hopefully, the overall performance and could be improved. Don't forget the internet bandwidth get double every nine to 12 months, even faster than Moore's law in integration and silicon technology. So how to narrow the gap between the maximum, uh, theoretical maximum bandwidth and uh, rarely utilized bandwidth is uh, the key of this research. So I'm going to show you uh, animation of uh, real world uh, test. The scenario is very simple. Um, we got a servo in Beijing and uh, that's, you know, namely 10,000 kilometers away. We launch a local application, that's a media uh, player, and we try to play some video clip online to see what happened. So this is a real world scenario. Although packet travel at the speed of light, and uh, maybe half of the speed light, 150 kilometers per second. Don't forget 10,000 kilometers. So resulting huge latency or, or discontinuities, things like that. So we, we suffer. Is that not that comfortable? So this is a traditional internet. If you use traditional internet to link, So a few years ago, I succeeded in winning a grant called the Euro-Asia Grid, sponsored by European Commission, and we provided option for people. So instead of using traditional internet, and uh, you could use our uh, provided platform, the same scenario, and uh, Beijing, 10,000 kilometers, playing video clips online, let's see what happened. By the way, have you heard of uh, this group before, Bond Girl Group? It's not Spicy Girl Group, it's a Bond Girl. Uh, they are uh, performing in Cuba. It's a very famous group, by the way. <laughs> so, shall we say, it makes a difference. So, more or less, that is uh, um, our contribution to cloud computing, because the internet is a key. Internet is a communication channel of cloud computing. We are addressing problem number four and uh, transfer bottlenecks. Here is a summary of our work. Uh, this column is uh, all applications, including media player. Media player is here. Not only media player, we, 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 we tested uh, data mining, uh, open office, even database, MySQL database, and the Firefox, and the Google Earth. So this column is a performance, or performance improvement in terms of speed up, how many times you can accelerate online applications on the cloud, on the internet. So you can see here on the media player, I show you the difference, the speed up is 1.8. 
And for other applications, you see uh, uh, bigger and uh, speed ups. Sometimes it's 10 times you can speed up things. So we narrow the gap. We take full advantage of increased bandwidth. So, you know, internet was originated 20, 30 years ago. It is time to consider the next generation of internet to provide better performance for a new computing paradigm, cloud computing. So that's our work. Uh, I don't want to go uh, to more details, and we received some uh, encouraging comments, you know, for EC grant, for UK government grant, the government, the organizing send independent reviewer to check uh, your proposal. So this is uh, some comments we have received. Uh, we have won such uh, uh, ACM IEEE Supercomputing Award. Uh, myself is here and is a big team, including some uh, IBM industry partners. So we have published intensively on leading computer science journals, for example, IEEE computers and ACM operating system reviewers. So over the past few years, I have received and, uh, uh, five million pounds on, on this piece of research. So EC, FP7, so seventh framework, and the EPSRC is the UK government funding body, so standing for engineering, physical science, and the funding councils. So uh, research number one, cloud computing. Second, green computing. I joined the University of Kent three years ago. Before that, I was with another organization called the Cambridge Cranfield High Performance Computing Facility. I was leading a research center there, a grid computing research center there. The supercomputer maintained there, as you can see here, is the Sunfire Galaxy, was ranked number 343rd in the world. You know there is a top 500 supercomputer list in the world. Have you heard of this? Every six months, they refresh the list. So at that year, in that year, we're ranked not bad, not good, 343rd. So my question is, how much money we have to pay to cover, obviously, electricity beer to maintain such a position? Not only electricity beer, but water beer. Why we need to pay water beers? Cooling. cooling. Yeah, exactly, cooling. So I give you four figures. You give a guess. Every year we pay 4,000 pounds, 40,000 pounds, 400,000 pounds, 4 million pounds. Which one is correct? Forty thousand. Four hundred thousand pounds to maintain not that good position, three hundreds. Four hundred thousand pounds. We pay quite a lot. So which imply today's computer is not that energy efficient at all. It's a monster, it's a energy hungry, so it's horrible. So we desperately need a uh, green computing, green computers uh, to protect our environment. So what is a green computing? Very simple. So my laptop is not isolated physical machine anymore. I'm interested in the interactions between my computer, all computers, and the environment. So it's relationship between computer and the environment. That is green computing. Some facts, and uh, for a company, and uh, half your beer may go to energy, yeah? Uh, power cost double every five years. Uh, energy cost, we exceed hardware cost. Uh, regulation are being introduced in Europe and USA. Have you heard of uh, European Commission carbon tax. Namely, everyone from outside Europe, um, 
you have to pay 10 euros for your ticket. Did you realize that? Yeah, that's so-called <laughs> carbon tax. For all oncoming airplanes from outside Europe. To study green computing, we need to, you know, refresh your memory. You, you know, we, we all have learned all these things. First law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, and uh, uh, the first law is here. So I hope you still remember first law of thermodynamics. The total amount of energy, so never disappear, okay? The total amount always remains as a constant. That's positive thing, so it's first law of thermodynamics. But the second law of thermodynamics, you may feel very disappointed. And the energy could be divided into two parts. One is useful energy, good energy. Another part is called uh, entropy, is negative energy. So unfortunately, with the progress of time, and the total amount of uh, useless energy and keep increasing. So eventually we all died here. So, so it's a dead end. The second law says so. <laughs> I don't know we can break the second law and entropy keep increasing and uh, is one way traffic. That is why it is our task to do green computing, to save ourselves, to save the planet, to save the whole universe, yeah. The second law says so, yeah. We are heading for the dead end, so that's here. No movement, no life, nothing, yeah, so all dead. Few years ago, we launched a new journal, Green Computing. Uh, I would like to use uh, a research to finish this piece of uh, research in green computing. As you can see here, traditionally, a hard disk drive is equivalent to 20 trees. So what does it mean by this equivalence? Why a hard disk drive equivalent to 20 trees? Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Hard disk drive use energy, energy generated by cores or oil, so it generates carbon dioxide. So it is down to the trees to absorb, to keep balance, absorb this, you know, emitted carbon dioxide. You know, trees and absorb, take in and carbon dioxide generate oxygen for all living things. So during the lifetime, let's say four years for IT equipment, during the lifetime, uh, you need a 20 trees to compensate those emissions, those carbon dioxide, 20 trees. If you change the design of hard disk drive and um, introduce something like a fresh memory at the front end, a disk, at the back end, so most of the time you spin off the disk. You know disk is uh, most power consuming because it's a mechanical stuff. You need to keep rotating the disk. You need to keep moving the head. So mechanical movement consume a lot of power. If you change the design and got uh, you know USB-like technology at the front end, those frequently used data and uh, you, you keep there, you spin off the back and the disk drive, and uh, the combination is equivalent three trees. Does it make difference? Yeah. So we published this paper on attribute transaction, so it's called redundant something, yeah. So we can do something and to reduce the power consumption to save our planet, that's their uh, green computing. Actually, uh, this is a product already, and uh, a career company, Samsung, they launched a product a few years ago called Hybrid Disk. Have you heard of this? Hybrid Disk. Yeah, so traditional disk at the back end, front end is a semiconductor, 
uh, technology, such a combination. Um, you are, on the one hand, you still serve your customers without sacrificing the performance too much. On the other hand, it dramatically reduces the power consumption. Thank you.